morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. Welcome to those that are joining us on Zoom. Uh, let's um, all worship God together this morning as we meet together in his name. Um, St. John's Church Council is this Thursday. It's at seven o'clock. Please note it's a seven o'clock start this Thursday for those of you on the church council. A couple of dates for your diary. Um, well, three really. It's Saturday the 26th of November is the Cone Lights Switch On. Uh, we're hoping to do something here just for a couple of hours over lunchtime. We'll be more information on that, but if you could just keep that uh, lunchtime free if you're available. Um, if you want to come to church, there'll be some stalls and some lunches and things like that, I think. Uh, Wednesday the 14th of December, uh, Nelson Civic Ladies Choir are doing us a free concert again for Christmas. Uh, that's half seven till nine o'clock on the Wednesday evening, the 14th of December, uh, and it'll be donations for the exchange project again. Uh, to keep the, the building uh, going, so that's good for that. Um, Lancashire Sings Christmas, it's back again this year. Uh, Thursday the 15th of December, and we're going to Boundary Mill Coffee Shop, BB's Coffee Shop up at the Boundary Outlet. So that's um, 7 o'clock on Thursday the 15th of December to sing the carols along with Radio Lancashire if you'd like to come to that. Um, please keep um, packing your shoe boxes. We've got another two weeks it's not next week, it's the week after. Uh, and also on that day, it's uh, um, the Remembrance Sunday, isn't it? So we will be starting a few minutes early. I've been asked by the lady who's preaching, Doreen, if we could just be here a little bit early, which will kill some of us, won't it? Um, so it's going to start just after 5 2, so that uh, at 11 o'clock we can actually have uh, the two minutes remembrance. So in a couple of weeks, if you could come just that little bit early um and be here ready for the remembrance at 11 o'clock that will be great and that is the day that we're bringing our shoe boxes back as well so i'm going to hand over to shirley now to lead us in our worship thank you good morning welcome to church and it's really lovely to see some children here i'm going to say something to you first of all because later on, I'm going to be talking about prayer. And I wanted to remind you that it doesn't matter how small you are or how young you are, you can talk to Jesus in prayer. Will you remember that? Yeah, good. So most of you will recall the verses from Isaiah chapter six, which describes Isaiah's wonderful spiritual experience of his vision of God in his temple, a moving experience of the presence of God and his angels. The seraphims were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. It had a wonderful effect on Isaiah. And it seems to me this morning that we all, at some time or another, have had an experience of the presence of God. Maybe you've been in a church building, or maybe you've been singing in a choir, or listening to something really wonderful, and you have experienced in your life and in your heart the presence of God, and it is a wonderful experience. Worship can be a powerful experience of God, and so too can being in nature, being in God's nature, be a wonderful experience for you. Maybe you've been walking in this area or anywhere else and you've seen God's creation. You've looked at all he has made and you've been filled with absolute wonder of everything, everything that he has created. Maybe you've studied the stars or you've watched Professor Brian Cox on the television and you've been filled with the wonder of the creation of God. It's that wow factor of worship that I really want us to experience this morning. Or you can, in your mind, remember that 
wow factor that was your experience. But first, a quiz. Now don't be frightened because these are not difficult questions. So, which star is nearest to the Earth? Did I hear somebody say sun? Quite right. Don't be shy, you can, you can call out. Which galaxy does the sun and the Earth belong to? The Milky Way, well done. I'm glad you're here this morning. How many stars in the Milky Way? I don't expect you to know the exact number, but a hundred thousand million, I'm told. Incredible. And Milky Way is only one of the galaxies, only one. Countless galaxies stretch beyond the reach of the most powerful telescope that we have. Picture several million galaxies stretching in all directions. And for a moment, consider the vastness of the universe and the wonder of the created world. This is what God created. And we're just going to watch for a few minutes a video. First this, God created the heavens and earth, all you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke, light, and light appeared. God saw that light was good and separated light from dark. God named the light day, he named the dark night. It was evening, it was morning, day one. God spoke, sky, in the middle of the waters, separate water from water. God made sky, he separated the water under sky from the water above sky. And there it was, he named sky the heavens. It was evening, it was morning, day two. God spoke, separate, water beneath heaven, gather into one place, land, appear. There it was. God named the land earth. He named the pooled water ocean. God saw that it was good. God spoke, earth, green up, grow all varieties of seed-bearing plants, every sort of fruit-bearing tree. And there it was. Earth produced green, seed-bearing plants, all varieties and fruit-bearing trees of all sorts. God saw that it was good. It was evening, it was morning, day three. God spoke, lights, come out, shine in heaven's sky, separate day from night, mark seasons and days and years, lights in heaven's sky to give light to earth. And there it was. God made two big lights, the larger to take charge of day, the smaller to be in charge of night and he made the stars. God placed them in the heavenly sky to light up earth and oversee day and night, to separate light and dark. God saw that it was good. It was evening, it was morning, day four. God spoke, swarm, ocean, with fish and all sea life, birds fly through the sky over earth. God created the huge whales, all the swarm of life in the waters and every kind and species of flying birds. God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill ocean. Birds, reproduce on earth. It was evening. It was morning. Day five. God spoke. Earth, generate life. Every sort and kind. Cattle and reptiles and wild animals. All kinds. And there it was. Wild animals of every kind. Cattle of all kinds every sort of reptile and bug. God saw that it was good. God spoke. Let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. 
so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them, prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of earth. Then God said, I've given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree, given them to you for food, to all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes. I give whatever grows out of the ground for food. And there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening, it was morning, day six. Heaven and earth were finished, down to the last detail. By the seventh day, God had finished his work. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day. He made it a holy day, because on that day, he rested from his work all the creating God had done. This is the story of how it all started, of heaven and earth when they were created. Let's say together from Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. He the Lord determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limits. And we're going to sing about the splendor of the King.
Let's pray. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you. You existed before the universe began. You designed the world and brought into being all that you had planned. We spoilt your design. We failed you and rejected you. Yet instead of rejecting us, you gave yourself for us, dying on a cross, demonstrating how much we mean to you. Help us to remember how precious we are to you. Help us to trust you more fully. Teach us how to live in harmony. Fill us with praise and thanksgiving. May our worship be acceptable to you. Forgive our carelessness. Give us a sense of responsibility for all that you have created. Teach us to love one another as you love us. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our transgressions as we forgive those who transgress against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let's sing a bit more about the beauty of the earth. We're singing from Sing of the Faith 102.
in our prayers, we need to be thankful too, don't we? So here are some thoughts to ponder. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you are more blessed than the million who will not survive the week. If you've never experienced the danger of battle, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony of torture, or the pangs of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people in the world. If you can attend a church meeting without fear or harassment, arrest, torture or death, you are more blessed than three billion people in the world. If you have food in the refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of this world. If you have money in the bank and spare change in a dish somewhere, you are among the top 8% of the world's wealthy. If you can read this message, you are more blessed than over 2 billion people in the world who cannot read at all. Just ponder that for a time. We're going to sing, sing to God's glory that colors the dawn of creation. Sing in the space one, six. going to share a responsive reading of Psalm 121. This psalm asks us to lift up our eyes to God. It's when our eyes are set on God that we see most clearly. Then we are never alone, then we are never lost, but safe in all our journeying. Just ask that you respond with the words in dark type. I lift
lift up my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your life now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Stacey. I don't know whether you've ever come across some of the funny prayers that children pray to God. Here are a few examples. Dear God, please put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There is nothing good in there now. Dear God, I want to be just like my daddy when I get big, but not with so much hair all over. Dear God, you don't have to worry about me. I always look both ways. Dear God, are you really invisible or is it just a trick? Dear God, instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you have now? Dear God, I am American. What are you? Dear God, if you watch in church on Sunday, I will show you my new shoes. Dear God, did you mean for giraffe to look like that, or was it an accident? Dear God, we read that Thomas Edison made light, but in Sunday school, they said you did it. So I bet he stole your idea. Well, some of them are quite funny. And you know, sometimes when you look back, we sometimes make some very odd requests of God, don't we? But it prompted me to talk to you about prayer. When Jesus asked this, was asked a simple question, teach us to pray, he gave a simple and a direct answer. Jesus didn't take 40 minutes to teach his disciples. A reading of the Lord's Prayer can be done in 20 seconds. Jesus gives his disciples an easily understood message. Now, for all the books written on prayer, Jesus communicates the heart of it in 20 seconds. Often when we approach prayer, we complicate it. We seek to, to create some experience that Jesus in no way describes or commends. The way of following Jesus is simple. It's not shrouded in mystery, or only available to the wise and the educated. As Paul says in the first book of Corinthians, God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. Prayer is primarily about forming and maintaining a relationship or a friendship with God. You can let go of all the complicated thoughts and feelings you norm that you normally associate with prayer. You might even consider um, changing the format of your own prayers if they have become stale or repetitive. Instead, continue to use the Lord's Prayer daily and to be open to simply pray 
in line with the pattern of that prayer. As Jesus taught his disciples. Listen to this translation written um, in the New Living Translation that Stacey is going to read to us. This reading is Luke 11, verses 1 to 13, teaching about prayer. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying. As he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Then, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For anyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So we're taught to be persistent in our prayers. I recently heard a story about a man who was walking with his young daughter about age seven. She ran ahead and disappeared around the corner of the woodland path. Moments later, this little girl was running towards her dad as fast as her little legs would carry her. As she reached him, she breathlessly exclaimed, Daddy, I've just seen a wow! Once home, some detective work and a postcard confirmed that she had come face to face with a full-grown stag. This was her wow moment. I recall a similar experience when we were at Centre Parks with our three-year-old granddaughter. She'd wandered down to the, uh, the, the stream at the bottom of our garden area. She came running towards us, gasping with excitement and calling out, Nana, Nana, look what's coming, look what's coming. Following her was a tall white swan. She was thrilled and certainly experienced that wow moment. She was so little and the swan was so tall. Each of us needs a wow moment with God. Moments when we're transformed by an experience of wonder and the greatness of God. Life drifts on, but here Jesus teaches that the first step into deeper friendship with God is the time when we are gripped by the scale, the majesty of God. Only then can we conceive that this, mis that this mystery is more than fiction, fable, or myth. 
more than a series of prescribed truths, a list of do's and don'ts, or our wants, but an actual person who longs to share life with you. In uttering well, I am in fact acknowledging God is so much more than I'd ever conceived or imagined. I see God as my source or parent, the one who gave me life, who sustains that life, and will bring me everlasting life as I pass through death. What am I to do but to bow the knee in true worship? Let's sing. Sing in the faith 112, O Lord, our Lord, throughout the earth, how glorious is your name. next Bible reading is taken from Luke chapter 18 verses 1 to 8 the parable of the persistent widow one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up there was a judge in a certain city he said who neither feared God nor cared about people a widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, 
learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Thank you, Stacey. How typical of Jesus to tell a story about a widow and a judge and then tell us to uh, listen to the widow rather than the judge. This widow just wouldn't take no for an answer. She's totally focused on her desire for justice and she won't give up until she gets it. Persistent, passionate, unyielding, and fully convinced of the worthiness of her cause. Jesus uses this story to tell his followers how they should pray. Try to picture this scene. The nagging woman is determined to obtain justice against her opponent. She refuses to accept the judge's non-involvement and eventually gets a hearing. She just keeps up the pressure. It seems that the parable is clearly, clearly focusing on her objective and disciplining herself each day to press on until justice is done. It seems that Jesus is suggesting to his followers that prayer is more effective when it's clearly focused and disciplined. In other places in Christ's ministry, he asks specific questions. What do you want? What would you have me do? He doesn't say that the widow is going to get all the demands that, she, that she's asking or that our prayers will be answered in exactly the way that we want. The point is that justice is done. God's kingdom is built on righteousness and justice. Our prayer for certain outcomes will only be written within the context of God's seeking God's will. I can remember once praying in junior school to, and answering the question, in what country does the river Amazon flow? And I wrote Africa instead of South America. I prayed that it might be right, but of course God isn't going to answer the prayer, that prayer. However many times I pray it, can you imagine the confusion and the devastation in the whole world if he answered that prayer. So sometimes we have to pray in line with what we need, which is justice and righteousness. Jesus' own life and ministry is a supreme uh, example of perseverance. Despite the frustrations he met and the many times his followers failed to understand him, he persisted. Jesus' own urgent prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane did not save him from an appalling death, but we can see God at work in his longing, nevertheless, to do God's will. If we want justice in, our, in this world of ours, we have to cry out day and night and never stop until things change. If we want justice, we may have to do more than just give a little to charity or say a few <coughs> fine words or even shed a, a tear or two. We may have to be like the nagging w widow who even though the judge was selfish and lazy, finally had to come submit to her constant nagging and her persistent demands. 
not because he suddenly became a good man or a God-fearing man, but because he cared about his, his uh, reputation and he's afraid that his character might be, uh, might be demanding. His character might be damaged. And he was fed up with her keep on and on about the same matter. She demanded justice. She knows her right and will not be intimidated by anyone in power, no matter how long it takes. I'll leave you with two thoughts. Firstly, if this dishonest judge will finally listen to a petition, how much more willingly and quickly will a loving God respond to the prayer of a disciple? Secondly, there is a warning. The disciple must not lose heart if his prayer is not answered. Jesus was telling his followers that they must persevere in faith and prayer. Amen. Now we come to our prayers of intercession. From your own congregation, I have to say to you that Joe is recovering at home. The family of Donna Hartley, we pray on the death of her husband. We pray for all the members of this community, this, com this congregation, especially for those who are ill at home. We bring them to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you know these people by name. You know of their needs. You know how much they want long for the comfort of your presence. And so we pray for them and pray that your loving arms will be around about them. I want us to have a moment's silence now as we bring our own thoughts and prayers this morning, as we think of our troubled world. So much suffering, death, dispute, hardship. Lord, pour your righteousness into our world. Loving God, we look around our world and we wonder where is the fairness in life? Where is the equality? Where is the justice? We see pictures of poverty on our TV sets. People scrambling for pathetic rations of aid. We see despots ruling with tyranny and fear. People crying over their dead or their lost relatives. Almighty God, we pray to you, pour your righteousness into our world. Loving God, when we wonder where to find equality, help us to look at our own lives what can we change that might make a difference? What attitude can we have that might impact on the grand scheme? What can we do in our little way that might alter the way the world works? Almighty God, pour your righteousness into us that we might recognize injustice and do what we can, because you care. We pray for those who hold positions of authority and responsibility. We pray for Rishi Sunak and his government. 
We pray that they will know God's daily renewing strength so that they can live with integrity as they serve the people of this country. We bring all these prayers in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We've looked at lots of things this morning and we have cause to celebrate at the faithfulness of our God, of his wonder, of his caring, and his way of teaching us how to get nearer to him. So we're going to say, come on and celebrate. We're singing the faith 44. Come on and celebrate. in your hands, O oh God. We lay everything on your altar. We take nothing back and we yield all things to your glory, now and forever. Bless us we, as we go to our own homes. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless you all.